Hey all, so this is the first lecture that I'm uh, producing for you. And again, my expectation is that you will watch this lecture in advance of class this coming Tuesday, and that you will also do the Berkey reading that uh, pages one through 39 before class on Tuesday. Again, I apologize for this quick start uh, for the class. I think it's really important for us to do this so that we have some flexibility built in later in the semester when we will undoubtedly need it. This will also allow us to, to devote our time in class on Tuesday, not only introducing the syllabus, but also diving right in and discussing the material. Uh, so you will have this obviously on YouTube for you to consult. I'm going to move even more quickly than I usually do with this lecture. It covers about 7,000 years. Uh, so the idea here is to give you the broad context for the rise of Islam, including the geographic, uh, cultural, and religious context uh, for the rise of Islam. So we are moving all the way back to the pre-Islamic civilizations right up until late antiquity. I'm moving very quickly, but my assumption is, is that you'll be able to stop and review areas that you think are not clear. Please do take notes, write down questions, and that can be the basis for our discussion on Tuesday. So again, I'm going to give you this basic quick background in the history and the geography so that we have a good fundamental uh, context for our discussion and our understanding of the rise of Islam. The Mediterranean, of course, was the site of many civilizations uh, going back thousands of years. There were, in fact, lakes in the Sahara. It was a very different topography than we have today. Uh, but the beginning of grazing actually led to a change and the desertification of this territory. We also want to pay attention to the Egyptian empire itself rising as it does uh, 3,000 years before the Common Era. So here on this map, you can see the broad area that was covered by the Egyptian Empire. Basically, it was the Nile River. The maps do tend to lie. Uh, the fact is, is this area just to the west and to the east of the Nile is all desert, hard to get any rain at all. So in fact, uh, ancient Egypt, just as Egypt, Egypt today, the vast majority of the population lives right along the banks of the Nile. The Nile floods on a regular ba basis, and that produces uh, an area of about a kilometer on each side of the river that is land that can be irrigated and um, since, again, since antiquity. Uh, the capital at this point is right near modern Cairo, Memphis. This is where the river itself meets the delta, and the delta is where the river then flows into the Mediterranean. So all this area around the delta uh, is full of canals, even today, and so it's an area of high agriculture. In addition to the uh, ancient Egyptian empire, uh, another pre-Roman empire is the Punic Empire. Um, this we see in uh, farther to the, the west, including what's today Tunisia. And that's where the city of Carthage is here. That's right across from Rome and Sicily, so you can get an idea of where this is, right in the middle of the Mediterranean, as well as large areas of territory here in the Andalusian Peninsula, the Iberian Peninsula, where Spain is, and then also even out here into the Atlantic coast. The Carthaginian Empire was very much a seafaring empire. And when, with the rise of the Roman Republic, we have Carthage as the, one of the great uh, enemies of Rome and the Punic Wars, the famous wars between Rome and Carthage uh, were a defining element uh, in this period. And then, of course, the Roman Empire itself, uh, first the Republic and then the Empire, uh, lasting until uh, the fifth century. Actually, arguably, Rome does not fall, it moves. So here's Rome again here, and here is then Byzantium, which becomes Constantinople, the main city of the Byzantine Empire, 
So the whole Eastern Roman Empire survives the invasion of the Goths and the Visigoths uh, into the Western part of the Roman Empire. But you can see in this, the, the, the largest extent of the, the Roman Empire here uh, in 117 of the Common Era is a uh, surrounding the entire of the Mediterranean, including Egypt and then the uh, old Punic Empire. So all these are folded in then to the Roman Empire. Now, the, one of the most important religions of this period was Judaism. Uh, Judaism uh, here is a recreation of the uh, temple. I can show you that here. Today, we would see the Dome of the Rock on top of this temple. Um, and this is what would be the old city of Jerusalem today, for any of you who have been there. Judaism is a, not a large religion, but was an important religious tradition in all of these empires. Um, of course, you may know the history of the Exodus, uh, that's Judaism in Egypt, and then entering into Palestine, which is not a political statement. Palestine is the name for that province. Uh, that the Romans had uh, in the Roman period, and then in the diaspora. So with the Roman conquest, uh, 63 before the Common Era, um, all this territory becomes part, uh, the territory of modern-day Israel and Palestine becomes part of the Roman Empire. And uh, Judaism at this point is tolerated as an official religion of the empire until the revolts of which uh, the Jesus movement was a part uh, that resulted in the Romans destroying the temple uh, in 70 CE. So all that remains of this temple now is this platform and then the wall, what's called the Western or the Wailing Wall is actually on the other side here. Uh, this is a view from the Mount of Olives then over into Jerusalem. There was yet another revolt, uh, and at the end of this revolt in 135 was the uh, decree by the Roman Empire that all Jews must leave the area of Palestine, the Roman province of Palestine. So this is the beginning of the official diaspora. This is Judaism now without a temple. Uh, so instead of priests worshiping God at the temple, and bringing sacrifices to the temple. Now Judaism has to figure out how it's going to be a religion without this temple. And this is rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism, which then uh, converts some of these rituals into home rituals. Uh, for example, the importance of the Sabbath meal, the lighting of the candles. Um, all of these things can be done without benefit of priests. Um, and uh, this form and way of thinking about Judaism uh, ended up involving then the uh, development of what's called the Talmud, which is a commentary on a legal text, which is the Mishnah. You don't need to know these terms precisely, but some of you will be familiar with them. Judaism becomes very important in terms of the rise of Islam and the role of law and the role of these legal experts, the sages in, Jerus in Judaism, becomes very important for our understanding of the rise of religious experts, the ulama um, in Islam. Then, of course, the Islamic conquest, which we'll be talking about much more detail on uh, Thursday. The Islamic conquests, uh, which really begin around 642, stretch all the way to 750, um, this then uh, takes over this territory where many Jews lived, and uh, these communities of Jews who lived in Iraq, uh, Egypt, and, and Spain all uh, continue to flourish under the Muslim empire. This may be a surprise to some of you who think that Muslims and Jews have always hated one another. Uh, this really is not the case. As we will see, uh, Judaism continues to flourish under the rule of Islam, and in fact, uh, the language of Judaism becomes Arabic. Christianity, of course, grows out of Judaism. I'm not going to go into that history, 
but rather to think about uh, how Christianity then rises and becomes important in the empire of Rome. Again, one of the most important points you can pick up from the Berkey reading is the identification of the major religions, Christianity and Zoroastrianism, with their major empires. So what happens in the Edict of Milan under Constantine, it was originally written in, 313, in 311, published in 313. This now allowed Christians to practice their religion openly. Until this point, Christianity is an illicit, an illegal religion within the Roman Empire. It also puts the emperor in a position of power. And so after this period, now that Christianity can be practiced openly, you have all these Christian churches throughout the Roman world, and in fact, way past the Roman world into Africa and, and Asia. Now these people can get together and start arguing about what Christianity is. That's what the famous councils are that Berkey talks about, this opportunity to bring all the leaders of the church, the bishops of the church together, in order to discuss major points of Christian doctrine. This identification of Rome, of the empire of Rome, with Christianity was made explicit in a decree of 381, which declared that worship of any other religion is illegal, that Christianity now, instead of just become a legal religion, Christianity has become the only, the official religion of the Roman Empire. Of course, Rome is attacked uh, beginning in 410, and the western part of the empire declines, uh, but Byzantium becomes the capital. So in a sense, the, the empire simply moves east. What we call the Byzantine Empire was called by many other people simply the Roman Empire. Uh, the Byzantines themselves called themselves Romans, although they spoke Greek and not Latin. Uh, these people who conquered the Roman, the Western Empire, the Visigoths, many of them practiced a form of Christianity called Arianism. Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, Arian nationalism or white supremacy. This refers to rather a bishop named Arius, who argued, again, as part of this discussion about what Christianity really is, who argued that Jesus was really human, that he wasn't divine at all. And it's interesting to think about how Islam picks up that concept of Jesus, understands Jesus to be an important person and a religious person, a prophet, in fact, uh, but not divine. That's the official Muslim position on Jesus. You can see that there's lots of back and forth. Uh, North Africa is in play here uh, as these invaders from the, the north then uh, take on and, and spread out and take over this area from the Roman Empire. But Justinian, a, a great emperor, again from the Byzantium capital, uh, takes back North Africa in 533. I'm going to show you this in a, um, in a moment. Uh, here you can see uh, Christianity. Again, maps are not really uh, accurate here, but it gives you a rough idea of these green areas of how broadly Christianity was spread in the Roman Empire in 200. And then this great expansion that happens um, after the Edict of Milan in, in 311. So Christianity becomes very widespread indeed in the Roman Empire. And then even more so, uh, by the time we get to the rise of Islam. Uh, at this point now, all of these areas are associated with Christianity. That said, let's please remember the important point that Berkey makes about religious practice. What we know about religion comes from the cities. We really have very little evidence about religious practice in the broader um, uh, rural territories. And it is very likely what evidence we do have suggests that religions were practiced only in an attenuated form, is what Berkey says. What he means by that is there are elements of Christian practice in these rural areas, but we do not have, uh, in, especially you know, in, in smaller communities, we do not have the control and the spread 
of uh, a doctrinal Christianity in these areas. And as I said, the form of Christianity practiced in much of Western, the, the Western Mediterranean at this point, is a form that is not the same as practiced uh, in the capital of Constantinople. Here's another map uh, that shows you uh, the expansion of the empire, again, under the Byzantine emperor Justinian. Uh, so once again, Rome had fallen, it had moved east, Constantinople, which is the same thing as Byzantium, um, is the, the capital. And uh, under Justinian, he takes back this area from the Vandals, from the Ostrogoths, from the Visigoths. He takes back these territories and reincorporates them into a larger vision of the Roman Empire. So at his death in 565, we again have most of the Mediterranean under Byzantine control. Remember, the Islamic conquests start around 640. So we are uh, looking at the map and at territories that are only lightly held by the time the Muslims will come out of Arabia here. Not only that, the Sassanid kingdom, I'll talk about it in just a minute, the Persians actually take all this territory from the Byzantines right before the rise of Islam, as we'll see. So we want to think of this as contested territory, as territory not fully under control of the Byzantines, and yet represent an idea that the Byzantines have that they are reestablishing the old Roman Empire. So these councils that I mentioned, remember these are made possible by the Edict of Milan in 313. And the first one here, the Council of Nicaea, establishes a common creed. In fact, many of you who are Christian may say the Nicene Creed. That comes from the Council of Nicaea in 325. You may recite the Nicene Creed as part of your Sunday worship. The important point here of the Nicene Creed is that God and Jesus um, are all are homoousios, are of one substance with the Father. Um, and so this idea of trying to parse out what is God doing, what is Jesus doing, what is the Spirit doing, how are they three different personas and yet kind of one God, um, is a difficult thing to do. And it's not entirely established uh, by the Nicene Creed. It's an attempt to make a common statement. The Council of Carthage establishes the first canon of Christian texts. So again, 419. Until this point, we just have these letters of Paul and different gospels floating around. Some of you may even have heard of things like the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Thomas that did not make it into the canon, this final list of acceptable texts that would form the Christian Bible. Then Ephesus and uh, Chalcedon were councils that further tried to understand what the nature of Jesus Christ was, this divine human being, exactly what parts of him were human, what parts were divine. And again, this is interesting for us because uh, the Quran very much participates in this discussion and spends a fair amount of time arguing about the nature of Jesus Christ. And finally, for our purposes, the Council of Toledo inserts a clause into the Nicene Creed um, that uh, makes the, if you will, raises up the role of Jesus. So currently uh, in, in churches in the West, this is the Catholic Church and Protestant churches that recite the Nicene Creed, uh, the, the statement is, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. So this and the Son in Latin is filioque. And uh, this statement was originally in 325, the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. Now it proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is ridiculous. This is a little word, right? But on the basis of this distinction, you have an enormous split 
in the churches. Uh, a lot of churches, a lot of Christian churches did not accept this. And this becomes one of the distinctions between the Roman church, again, Toledo. So this is in Spain. It's way to the west of the Christian world at this point. The Roman church uh, understands this higher role for, the, for, the, for Jesus and, and the spirit coming from Jesus. And the Eastern church, which becomes today the Orthodox church, still does not accept the addition of this clause. Again, our purpose here is simply to understand that Christianity is by no means a unity when we get to the rise of Islam. So the Byzantine Empire. Uh, the Byzantine Empire continues on until its final fall in 1453. So for the entire uh, class that we have on Islamic civilization, the Byzantine Empire exists and it is a very important entity. We will see that it's involved with the Crusades and many other things as well. The Byzantine Empire is essentially a city-state uh, centered on Constantinople that then extends out and has lots of other territories as well. So this is the size of the Byzantine Empire after the Muslim conquests, right? So all of this area in the Middle East, all of Egypt, all of North Africa is now Muslim territory. Again, we're looking here at 1025, okay? Um, and this is the size of the Byzantine Empire for the vast majority of the period that we're looking at in our class. Um, the empire itself uh, was an important, uh, in the imagination of people as to what a city was, I'm giving you a, a little a view here of Asgiliath, those of you who are uh, Tolkien geeks as I am, uh, because it's actually based on this, uh, the architecture of Byzantium. Um, and the buildings that we see in the city of Byzantium can tell us something about what, we're, what a person is meant to do. As you go into the building, uh, what does your eye do? What does the body do? Uh, I argue that when you enter a lecture hall, you are given a choice. You can either go to the front or you can sit down in these other seats. The building itself forces you to make a choice and to do things. Um, so when we look, for example, at the Hagia Sophia, this is the great cathedral of holy wisdom um, and it still stands today. Uh, it certainly was there uh, during the time of the, uh, uh, the fall of Constantinople in 1453. At that point, it was already a thousand years old. Uh, this building was built um, uh, in the, the height of the Byzantine Empire. And what your eye does as you go in is it goes up. This almost impossible dome floating as it does on two semi-domes, uh, forcing the eye to move up and to be filled with a sense of, of awe. That's what I mean by a building being designed to force you to do something. Uh, we also have uh, in this a real expression of power, right? So this is a, an, it's an awe that you should have in terms of God, but also in terms of the emperor. And the emperor here, the, the Roman emperor or the Byzantine emperor, is very much in the position of being the head of the church. And this gathering of resources to express power, we can see explicitly in these beautiful mosaics. Here uh, done, and a mosaic, if you don't know, is, is a, an image made with lots of little tiny stones. And here, um, these stones have been treated with gold leaf and that, and, and this beautiful blue, which again, after 1500 years is still vivid. Um, all these colors uh, done, you know, hyper pixelated, right? With, with all these little stones, um, all of this done to represent power and to represent a feeling of awe in front of the Byzantine emperor. Today, the uh, building is a, uh, museum also now used as a mosque. 
uh, you can see that uh, there are these medallions, one of them says Muhammad, another one says Ali here, uh, this is Omar. These are various important personages in the life of Islam, but the building itself by and large still retains its initial character. The empire had uh, was, was founded on the emperor, of course, uh, but in this image here that we have from a manuscript, a Byzantine manuscript, you can see the emperor in the center, surrounded by these others. Now, if Game of Thrones is more your interest, uh, you certainly get the idea here of the Iron Throne and then the small council around that. Uh, a similar concept here in the Byzantine Empire. These councils were very important uh, in terms of uh, themselves having a great deal of power but also that they were the ones who wrote the history of the emperor. Uh, they were well-trained uh, and had a, a whole educational system devoted to making sure that these were um, well-trained and well-informed advisors to the emperor. So the emperor is one leg of the empire. The bureaucracy then is another leg of the empire. A third is the army, uh, and here there was a standing army that was largely composed of mercenaries. Uh, this will become very important in the Crusades, but the Byzantines again used their power as a city-state to buy armies that would serve them. Um, and then the fourth leg is the church itself. Uh, Constantinople, as it became known as, or Byzantium, was not one of the original states, or one of the original cities of Christianity. Uh, and so in order to raise the level of importance of Constantinople, the emperor started gathering relics. And what I mean by relics are things that were associated with the life and experience of Jesus. For example, a piece of the true cross the crown of thorns that rested on Jesus's head, or the burial cloak that he was wrapped in um, when he was put into the grave, and many other things besides that, including bones and teeth and hair, and even Mary's mother's milk uh, from various saints and individuals who were connected to the life of Jesus. So this gathering of relics in the city made the city itself holy in a sense. We're going to jump over now to the Persian Empire, and I hope that you're be, uh, becoming familiar with the map here and you understand that this is Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. Here's Arabia. We'll get to that in a second. And Arabia is very much situated between these two great empires. The Persian Empire, with its uh, capital down here in Ctesiphon. Uh, so this is uh, the Tigris and Euphrates River flowing through here. And on the Tigris River today is the modern city of Baghdad, and that is right next to the ancient city of Ctesiphon. So Iraq, then modern state of Iraq, uh, is central to this empire. And then all of the modern state of Iran, as well as you may recognize Kabul and Herat, Kandahar as major cities of Afghanistan. Uh, so right up against the borders of the uh, Sangha Empire in India at that point, right? So this is a huge empire uh, covering many different modern nation states today. Uh, that was the Persian Empire. Uh, the Sassanids were the dynasty. Persia is the place. Iran and Persia um, are the same for our purposes. So all of this is referring, again, just as we have Byzantine and Roman and Christian empires, also we have Persian and Iranian and uh, Sassanid empire, all referring to the same thing. Ctesiphon uh, was a very large and important city, still some ruins today that go back to this period, and it was very much a rival with Byzantium in terms of being a very wealthy uh, city-state. The royal religion, again, was Zoroastrianism, described in some detail uh, by the Berkey text, as he says that Zoroastrianism uh, was 
a very diverse religious tradition, as was Christianity, as we have seen, uh, that there are pieces of this that were part of the royal practice, including royal priests who undertook sacrifice in front of fire altars, the role of fire and the role of sacrifice being a central part of official Zoroastrianism. But the broader religious world of the Persian Empire was much more diverse, including significant Christian and Jewish groups, Buddhism on the far eastern uh, border there with India, um, as well as many kinds of what Berkey talks about as paganism, or what I refer as polytheism, so worship of a variety of different goddesses and gods and natural areas and natural forces. So all of this together made for a very diverse religious world. This is a map of the modern Middle East uh, so that you can hopefully start to uh, think about these territories. Maybe this is more familiar to you. Again, the Persian Empire had its capital in Tesaphon, which is right where modern Baghdad is, and so undertook all this territory here, including Iran and Afghanistan, all as part of that Persian Empire. And the Byzantine Empire is centered here on Constantinople, um, and then including all of this territory uh, at that point. Um, the cities of Mecca and Medina will be talking about more on Thursday. So in our discussion then on Tuesday, I hope that you'll bring questions of terminology, make sure that you have a clear understanding of the main concepts, both in the reading and from my lecture. I want you to think about why I begin my lecture where I did, and why does Berkey begin his lecture where he does, his reading where he does. This notion of beginnings, of where we start telling the story of Islam, is an important thing to think about. And then, if you could, find some particular illustration that Berkey uses, uh, either a story he tells or a quotation he makes. Uh, he uses lots of examples in this uh, reading, and it, it helps to kind of slow down and pay attention to something in particular. So if you could uh, take a moment to pull something out that you think is worth talking about on Tuesday, that will really help our discussion along. And finally, for next time this for Thursday, your reading will be uh, just pages 39 to 53 from the Berkey text. And we will go on talking about the rise of Islam. And that's it for my lecture for today. Uh, again, I know this is a lot to digest. We'll have time on Tuesday to talk about all of it. And I look forward to seeing you then.